log that into the uh, the question box there, and we'll get to that. And you can, I think you can also vote on it. So if you like someone's question, you can you can like it, and it will go up in stature, which is pretty neat. Um, and I'll go ahead and launch a poll really quickly as we uh, do some introductions. Um, I want to go ahead and allow our panelists to quickly introduce themselves. Bob, I'll start with you, and then we'll go to Charlie, and then to go to Moritz, and just quickly um, tell us who you are, what company you are, um, and then and then afterwards we'll jump right into it. All right. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate you having me on. Uh, great topic, uh, very encompassing. So I think it, if there are any questions or follow-ups, uh, just so we're expedient today and uh, efficient. Uh, certainly feel free to send something to me uh, after the case. I'm Bob Mullaney, the president and CEO of RG Barry Brands. Uh, we have offices in New York and our main uh, corporate headquarters in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, our two main, for this case, for footwear distributors and retails in America, our number one brand uh, here is Deer Foams. Um, we do have Columbus Product Group that capitalizes on our great uh, slipper strength. And we also have a division, Bagolini, which is a uh, a handbag and nylon bag company uh, that has a great niche following uh, of women. Um, I, before that, I was, I think, the uh, reason some of that I was joined to this call uh, by time at Rockport, rejuvenating the brand in the States, and then on to shoes.com, we're primarily centered around uh, a lot of e-commerce strategies, and I just simply was following the consumer. So I think that's why I'm here. So previously, I was the president of shoebuy.com, now shoes.com that we sold to Walmart slash Jet uh, a few years back. Fantastic. Charlie, do you want to yeah, quickly introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Charlie Holcomb, the Global Vice President of Retail Industry Solutions. Uh, for those of you not familiar with First Insight, we're a leading customer-centric merchandising platform. Um, enabling smart, data-driven product decisions, leveraging your voice of the customer. Uh, we've been doing this over a dozen years, have a, over 130 customers, many footwear customers. Uh, before First Insight, I was uh, actually with uh, Kohl's Department Stores. Um, and at Kohl's, one of my roles was I brought First Insight into the organization, um, really in effect to reduce the amount of uh, in-store um, testing that we do, which we know is expensive and not necessarily effective. Um, and uh, then before that, I had worked in various retail positions across uh, May Company and Macy's. So I'm glad to be here today and hope to have a good conversation. Great. Thank you. Uh, Moritz, if you want to introduce yourself really quickly as well. Yes, a pleasure. So my name is uh, Moritz Schiebold. I'm the CEO of Volumental. And Volumental, our mission is that we want to uh, help consumers find the perfect fitting foot. And the way that we go about that is that we really scan your feet. We can tell you what fits around your feet compared to the rest of the 7.5 billion people on this planet. And then we can use algorithms in the background to match that with the styles that are available in the market. We've been doing that in physical retail for a couple of years. In the US, we're going to see us with retailers such as New Balance, Fleet Feet, uh, Roadrunner Sports. We're working on getting that to mobile phones as well. Um, I guess I'm here today to talk about uh, technology in this space and how especially uh, data can shape consumer experiences going forward. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and I think that, Maurice, if you can just lean in a little bit closer to the microphone, I think somebody said it's just, yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I do wanna, I do wanna thank uh, First Insight uh, and Volumental for sponsoring uh, this series that we've got going on. Um, both of them work with a large number of footwear brands, and so they have really interesting insights across the industry um, that they can bring today to talk about. Um, and I do want to also thank Klarna, uh, who was also a sponsor. Unfortunately, their speaker um, had to drop at the last minute. Uh, we all know how that is during COVID when things come up that you have to drop off and go to something. But, uh, but Klarna also is a, a sponsor of this as well, and we'll get into that. Um, as, as we jump into it, Bob, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tee you up first to, to talk about something. But We've got the poll numbers in, um, quite a number of votes, and I'm, I'm really interested. I'm always interested to see how many people think that uh, shoe sales online growth will happen. And, and it's interesting because if we look at total sales um, of all goods, e-commerce is, is less than 20% globally. Um, and all of a sudden COVID hits, and all of a sudden we see huge jumps of adoption and less fear of using it, um, even with shoes where we see you know, fit issues. Uh, which are a challenge, but we've got 60% of the people think 
In, in five years, half of all shoe sales will be online. Um, so I, I want to get your thoughts on that from, from an expert uh, in e-commerce sales, especially around footwear. Um, and then also just get your view of the current situation and landscape and retail as you see it. I know, again, that's very broad to ask you that, but I really think people want to hear what CEOs are thinking about right now in their organizations and, and how they're looking at the retail landscape. Yeah, it, it's a good question, Andy. This is one of the things when you had asked us to join, what is e-commerce versus what is digital? And I think uh, it has to be some basic definitions that need to be highlighted. The digital interaction with the consumer to get in the consideration set uh, is one thing. And then e-commerce, I look at as more transactional, actually conducting the trade. My, when, you, when I saw the question, I didn't know how to answer it. I leaned into my screen if you didn't see it. Because in, in three years, what will be e-commerce? Meaning, uh, you know, buy online, pick up in store. Would that be considered an e-commerce sale where the transaction was done and the actual transfer of goods happened at the store location? Uh, that's happening more frequently now. So I think the intersection of the two, it won't be either or, it'll be an and. Uh, and I think some of that stuff is coming up. So I think, um, you know, I, I'm going to date myself here a little bit, but right now what's accelerated, to your point, what just happened with COVID is accelerated. You know, think about food delivery, right? Um, you know, the food delivery business has become a huge focus right now, whether it's Grubhub or uh, DoorDash or Uber Eats just bought Postmates. So there's four main competitors in the space. Um, and it happens in the food industry. And for $15 from Chipotle, we're willing to pay a fee to have somebody drop it off at our house. It reminds me of the milkman. Um, but today to get a hundred dollar pair of shoes or there's some thresholds, you know, people are resistant to pay a service charge of deliver it to your house. So I do think value proposition will come into play here. Um, and I think it's clear the customer COVID-19 has done two things, accelerated things that were already in motion, what customers value, which is convenience uh, and a lot of things around the home. And I think the other thing it's disrupted, right? There's some serious consumer trends that have changed. Um, and there's a lot of more heavier work needed by us brands, uh, major shift in consumer behavior like travel, right? Uh, travel was doing ex very well you know, pre COVID. And now, um, you know, what, what does that look like? Uh, do you have to realign your service, uh, your resources if you're in the travel business or do you need to pivot uh, to a new strategy? You know, and the pivot like that for acceleration, Uber had a very uh, tough business with Uber, you know, uh, services and then they moved to Uber Eats and they pivoted their strategy. That's a that's an idea of disruption. I think that the footwear industry needs to think about is a consumer trend. Some of them is disruptive and some of them actually just accelerated. These trends were alive and well well before COVID. It's only uh, the digital uh, adoption rate has just accelerated now uh, because people are at home. People have a little more time on their hands uh, to uh, participate. Do you think from your, from your standpoint, you know, the challenge always is internally we talk at FDRA about e-commerce and I think in the past people have seen it as an add on to what their traditional model is, right? They saw e-commerce as a revenue stream that could add and help them grow, but the margins are still very thin. Going forward, how do we operationally look at e-commerce? I mean, if we're going to be doing a lot of sales, even, you know, let's, let's strip it out and say it's pure e-commerce where they buy online and it's shipped to their house. It's not where they can pick it up. It's coming from a warehouse to their house is a, a direct pure play. How, you know, what are you guys, or in general, what do you hear, what do you think about, about maturing the channel to make sure that your margins are a, a lot better than what they were in the past? I think there's two ways. Um, if the product is, take this the right way, um, mundane, um, or the product is uh, commoditized, then you really need to concentrate all the way back to your sourcing channels and material procurement all the way through and look at everything from drayage to ocean freight to, you know, uh, last mile logistics. So, I, I, and, and how much inventory and how much cash you have there. So sure, that, that, that is one thing that we're looking at quite uh, diligently. So complete, uh, I think, it, you know, we know in the footwear business, we've had to look at our supply chain. This is forcing us to even a little bit more intensely. But I, I think this always goes back to the, you know, the brands that prosper. You mentioned Adidas Boost earlier. I came from there during a the time when we were owned by them at Rockport. You know, innovation and brand management 
you know, to allow, engage, and really make people excited about your brand. There are some people who are doing it in the industry. You know, that is probably more critical than ever in the consumer insights that you can glean from online and interact with the consumer digitally and get information real time. That's the most Im important thing. And may I suggest, Andy, that like we're making this out to be about Amazon, and it is. I mean, Amazon has captured a lot of ch share, but Amazon has captured share because they've made the mundane, you know, convenient, right? Um, it, it's not the, I mean, I don't think it's an overly engaging shopping website, though still a lot of people go there to search for products. And so I think it's on us brands. I think it's on us in the industry to create excitement. You see what partnerships, you see what collaborations do when you do have uh, exciting things going on in the industry, it does cause a stir and we still have an obligation I think more than ever to utilize the tools at our hand. There's a new tool box, so to speak. There's a new tool that we need to uh, utilize and pivot to and, and rather quickly. When I say this didn't happen overnight, um, you can go, you know, the history of retail from, you know, back in the day where there was the corner store to the department store to the big box. Um, you know, the market share or the market capitalization of the off price channel has grown quite dramatically in the last 10 plus years, while some of the more esteemed channels have been on a steady decline for this just didn't happen in 2020. Um, so I think the customer has told us what they value uh, and what's mundane or, you know, an execution or a commodity exchange or what what means a little bit more so they can uh, have a more value proposition and afford to um, sell online profitably, so to speak. Hope that yeah. helps. Hope that wasn't too much. No, you're right. I think you're right. And I'll bring in Charlie more to, on this as well. Charlie, when we're looking at e-commerce and we're looking, I, I think specifically on operations, right? Like I, I think, how do we operationally look at e-commerce and, and improve the model we had to make it profitable and engaging and, and make sure from your, I mean, especially from first insight, make sure you have the right inventory in the right place at the right time, at the right price, right? So, you know, I, I'm interested to hear what you're hearing from your retail partners about e-commerce kind of morphing and changing. And then uh, and then afterwards, we'll bring in Moritz to ask the same question from him. Yeah, I mean, sure. We're, we're seeing our customers um, really taking steps to make sure their inventory is, is right, um, whether it's for brick and mortar or the whole omni-channel chain. I mean, I think it's, it's having the right product, you know, priced right, um, available to the right customers. Um, you know, you're talking about differentiating your product, um, you know, whether that's through private brand or through exclusivity and making sure you're designing and developing those products to, to fit to that customer. Um, localized assortments are becoming more and more important, um, servicing the communities. And, you know, um, and then also I'm hearing a lot about people placing bigger bets on, on items, uh, really making sure you're picking the winners and really putting the inventory behind them so that across the omni-channel, that customer can get that um, get the product they want when they, when they need it um, uh, quickly and more efficiently than, than they have in the past. So, um, and really, everybody's talking about leveraging technology um, to get them there. I mean, that's a, asking a lot to make all those decisions and you really have to leverage the technologies that are out there and, and listen to your customer to, to make those right decisions. Or it's what, you know, especially from you guys being a technology-driven company um, and, and, you know, trying to work with a lot of retailers, trying to upgrade their their websites and platforms, uh, you know, what, what are you hearing from your partners about how they're looking at e-commerce and maturing operations around that? I would actually like to, uh, to hang on to what Bob was talking about there in the beginning. I think the definition of what is e-commerce and uh, what is big and mortar is, it just doesn't really make sense in the same way as before anymore. Mm, that's a good point. I think you can make a, a statement and can say that close to 100% of all purchases will be uh, digital in some way, shape or form. And uh, there will be in the store and there will be uh, online. Uh, we looked into this with, um, with our friends at, at Google to understand what does a consumer journey actually look like if somebody buys a pair of shoes right now. And based on their data, we saw that if you're buying a pair of shoes, uh, it's not uncommon that somebody actually has more than a hundred touch points with your brands and with the product before they actually get out and open their wallet. And that is somebody that is sitting at home researching the product, uh, is coming to a store, figuring out is this actually gonna fit me or not, 
looking at their phone, okay, how does this price that I'm paying here actually compare to, uh, to anything that I can get online? And I think that kind of thinking, that is what needs to, uh, what needs to drive your, your strategy. How can you create an environment, an ecosystem that allows a consumer to get the information that is relevant, that's engaging for them, and then make it easy to actually convert that into, into a purchase. So I think what we're gonna see more of going forward is that consumers are gonna look for valuable information that adds to their journey. And a lot of that information is gonna be around personalization. And then in the end, uh, it's gonna be about data ultimately. What is the information that you have on a consumer that you're interacting with and how can you use that information to provide superior service to them? Uh, I think the people that are going to solve that part, those are going to be the companies that are successful. But I actually would like to, uh, to put a question to Bob in this, which is, uh, as somebody uh, with the technology background in the retail industry, how do you actually make sure in your team that you have a culture and the setup that allows for innovation and for iteration, that allows for speed in an industry that historically has been much slower? It's a great question. Uh, it's not easy. Um, you know, my journey to RG Barry was to bring that uh, new thinking uh, to the company. Uh, the company did uh, made, you know, slippers quite well for uh, long before I ever got there. Um, so, you know, it was taking all the goodness that was with the company previously and then modernizing the company and how, to your point, I think it's more your terminology about than technology. It's, it's a consumer journey. Always, first and foremost, who are we serving and how are we serving? And if you don't interact with the consumer digitally, I couldn't agree with you more, um, you can't manage your brand anymore. Um, and I think that if you don't understand how he or she is thinking, uh, it's really difficult uh, to add real value to their lives. Uh, and I do think that the available, she's talking to us quite frequently. Uh, are we listening? Um, so that's the difference between digital, to your point, or e-commerce. E-commerce is a transaction to me where they, you know, decide to do it. And then it's even getting complicated. Not that I've figured it out yet. You know, at certain organizations, I can see the, you know, Omni experience, who's getting credit for the sale. Uh, the website, you know, the website team or the e-commerce team or the stores when they pick up the product, you know, from inventory in the stores. So we're, I think we're working through that as a, uh, as an industry, but I think that evolution is here more than ever. And I actually think it'll start to uh, evolve our thinking. We only think of it in um, not cross pollinating culturally into the company. Uh, I established best practices quite candidly and, I brought in experts from outside uh, and the, the intention was uh, that the team who was in place could learn from best practices by watching some of their teammates uh, and that would be infused into the organization. Um, that has gone well. Uh, we have accelerated. That has certainly helped us. Uh, but like anything, not fast enough. Certainly in COVID, I wish we were even further down our path of uh, um, a more modern company in terms of consumer and her digital experience. So we have work to do. We have work to be done. Um, good news is we started three years ago or two, you know, almost three years ago when I got here in the um, late 2017. So from 2018, 19, we've been practicing on it uh, and getting better, but it's not easy. If you, you know, you can't just pick it up today. It's, it's, it takes a little bit uh, as you know, um, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of things to consider. I think some organizations need to be thinking about consideration. Some need to be thinking about conversion. Some need to be thinking about, um, you know, uh, how, how do you create some excitement to get some uh, awareness on your brand? So I think there's a number of ways to, and you can, again, there's a new toolbox. You can go crazy with this. So I think you just have to, you have to, you have to zone in on what, what toolbox you decide to and what your priorities are. It's not easy, but it's certainly uh, needed. I think that's a good point because I think sometimes when we think of technology, you can be sold on a lot of bells and whistles that may not fit your culture, or fit your product, or fit your audience at all. I mean, you don't need a Friari to drive your system if you're if you're selling twelve dollars pairs of shoes at Walmart, right? I mean, it's just not what you need to invest in to engage that consumer. And I think sometimes 
companies grab at things and try to jam them together. And especially when you're looking at a technological backbone, like a, like a website sales system that you got, you know, it's not coded for that. You can't just keep stacking things on top. And I think, I think it behooves a lot of our executives to become a lot more technologically savvy. And of course they have good technology people, but I think it behooves us to become a little bit more wise about the technologies we want to integrate and use and why um, more than we ever have before. And, um, and I, I, want to, I want to jump into that too, because I want to get your guys' insights on what you see going forward. We'll, we'll focus on e-commerce for this one, and then we'll jump to brick and mortar, and then we'll go to a little bit more on consumer insights after that. But I'm really interested to hear your, your, your opinions on how you look at websites and whether you think they're already outdated. Like I know a lot of, a lot of brands have already updated their websites and got them clean and clear. Are they, you know, when we look at some of the stuff and, and I, I, I'm kind of laughing because I, you know, Moritz and I've had these conversations where we talk about in the future, there's not going to be a size on a website, nor should there be. So when we're thinking about selling online or digital interactions, when we talk about personalization, it's grabbing all the data where we are, already have a foot scan of that individual and you don't, and if they log into your, to your program, your rewards program, you have all the information they should never have to see a size and they should never have to look at shoes that, that aren't in their size or in, in the inventory list that comes down. So we look at some of this stuff, some of these technologies that we need to integrate to update. Um, and then, you know, Bob mentioned, um, you know, Amazon's website. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing because Amazon's website is a bare bones website and people of course have been using it for a long time, but you can't really build a relationship on Amazon, I don't think. Um, because there's not, there's not a way to dynamically tell your story um, when people are just looking at price and copy descriptions. There's no videos really, there's no way to engage it. So when we look at websites going forward, you know, from your standpoint, what kind of technologies, and I'll start with Charlie at the top, what, so, what sort of technologies do you think people are gonna start using and integrating to make the, that audience experience and that, you know, to what Mortz was saying about those touch points, how do we make those touch points more impactful and how do we re how do we use technology to reduce the friction from you know browsing to buying really how do we reduce all those barriers that we have what do you what are you thinking about that going forward you know i think uh, we're speaking with a lot of our customers about um 3d and bringing that into the ecosystem and how that reduces a lot of friction not just from the development perspective where you're reducing time and physical samples and expense there but also from a customer facing you know, so I think the customer is going to get more and more comfortable interacting. The consumer is going to be more comfortable interacting with a 3D image, you know, where you could actually, you know, utilizing a first insight test, you can test using 3D image where they can be able to see it very clearly and rotate it and move it and really understand the product where eventually can they start buying off of that 3D image and be more comfortable with that, um, you know, rather than going through some of the hoops to get product shot and online, it can really reduce time and, and make much more frictionless um, buying experience. Yeah, and I, I think to that point, before we go to Moritz and back to Bob, I think it's really interesting. There's companies out there like Expedi that allow you to integrate your, if you have a PLM or some kind of system where you have your bill of materials and you have certain parameters, you can allow them within a framework to design their own shoes, right? And I think that's the real big thing of, you know, to Bob's point, how do we streamline our, our supply chain so that if we did want to go personalization, that we could get it to the consumer very timely and, and still not have a huge jump in price increases. But certainly on a website, they should be able to take a 3D model, spin it around, change colors on it, change types within parameters that the brand sets. And we really don't see much of that. Um, Maurice, I'll, I'll bring you in now to, you know, let's talk a bit about the fitting aspect of it, right? I mean, I, I think that's the biggest thing when we talk about digital sales is if someone is afraid to go into a store right now, to try on a pair of shoes and they're ordering online, they're probably ordering three pairs and returning two. Unfortunately, <laughs> hope not. Um, so when you when you see that and what you guys are working around, what do you what do you see the future as for the digital interactions and some of the tools that people can use? Yes, I think if you like blatantly stated, if you think about it right now, if you're going to uh, to Amazon and you're buying a refrigerator, right, and then you go to Amazon and you buy a pair of shoes it's essentially the same experience. And that doesn't make any sense at all. If you're buying a refrigerator, like the set of information that you need to make a good decision, it's completely different than uh, what you need if you want to understand you're buying a pair of shoes. So 
I think what's going to change dramatically over the next couple of years is that we're going to move towards an online environment that's, begun, uh, that's going to become more and more haptic. So it's going to be richer in information in the sense that uh, you're going to have 3D content to, uh, to play around with products. You're going to have augmented reality that actually allows you to uh, overlay digital content in the real world, actually overlay um, shoes on your feet. That kind of technology is actually going to allow you to uh, understand which shoes are going to fit you how, and it's going to be possible to communicate that visually on a screen as well. So I think what we're going to see, if we're thinking about uh, 2025, uh, what is different, uh, I think the, the online shopping experience is going to be uh, dramatically more immersive um, and exciting and rich in information than, uh, than what we have right now, which is this, this flat experience that is the same experience as buying a refrigerator. Yeah, and I think we should mention this thing called 5G, right? Fifth generation of technology coming online and what that would do. And I don't, I don't think people really have d dived into understanding that. M most people understand, oh, well, my phone will be faster. Yes, your phone will be faster, but there's less latency. And, and the best example that I heard about this is a doctor from San Diego can sit uh, in his desk and do a surgery in New York because there'll be no latency, right? And he can use the tools. So if you think about that in that context of doing surgeries remotely um, and how amazing that is, um, it just, it begs to, to make us think about the new technologies we don't even know yet that are going to come online. I mean, I always tell people, you know, the first Jason Bourne movie, Jason Bourne was taking out a block ops government operation with a flip phone. And then all of a sudden, two years later, he's got an iPhone and have a, you know, so just in that short amount of time, you know, things change quickly. Um, Bob, I, you know, I'm interested to know your thoughts or your ideas around what kind of technologies you think people start to be using to, to engage consumers digitally that is a bit different than now. And maybe even some of the stuff has been here for a long time and we just haven't used it in the footwear industry. Yeah, li listen, I'm a little uh, more simplistic. To get back to the journey of the consumer, the websites versus, you know, so where does she, you know, where does she get awareness, right? Uh, where, and then when can you get her to a point where she's going to consider your purchase? Is that when she comes to your website, right? Like, the, you know, the awareness, if, if Google and Amazon have 80 plus percent of all product searches, then they have a lot of power in this purchasing path if it's a category purchase, right? If, if that's the case. So how do we as an industry create awareness or uh, create some excitement? And I think that's the most important thing that we as an industry need to. And then I think the other thing I grapple with, that happens a lot in social channels, right? Uh, so when people want to be entertained, there's a high level of awareness going on these days. And some of the brands who know what they're doing uh, are doing it quite well, whether it's the gaming world and Bathing Ape. And, you know, there's some, some really good uh, uh, marketers out there. And then I always say, how do you get that awareness and get them into consideration that they think that that awareness relates to them? And I think that's what we're talking about with artificial intelligence and how do we can intersect them in their 100 points, I guess. I was unaware of that before uh, this call. 100 points. I knew there was a significant amount of points. I didn't know there was 100 points. Uh, and so the data does tell you, when can you get them to the consideration? And that's why I say digitally. This, this thing here is quite a powerful tool. Uh, and I, I think the other thing about websites, when you say website design, it's, you know, um, besides the three main things of, you know, cons you know, getting them to people to conversion um, is I, I think that we, the device uh, is one of the biggest things, right? This is a tool. This is now digitally your brain, even when you've been in stores pre-COVID. And I think a lot of us as brand managers and overseeing companies weren't we need to spend more time with that and her journey point because she might've converted on the, on the floor at, at Kohl's. She right. might've converted at the floor at Nordstrom, but she probably Googled uh, somebody or somebody somewhere, something uh, to get an information set. So I think those uh, tools, the only other thing I would say that really needs to happen these days is managing your brand online means that you need to manage your catalog. And I think that's one of the things that you had mentioned about websites, it's curation. Right. It's what you're putting forward, how you're putting and when, you know, everyone still thinks that everything comes through a landing page. It's that's old school. That just is not the case. They're shopping off of the website. They, a lot of times they're 
click the purchase path goes right to the landing page or hopefully the checkout page. And, you know, one of these great, um, you know, payment systems already has your information already in there. So, you know, cause we're really convenient or, you know, potentially uh, we love convenience, right? I mean, we think it's such a bother to enter all our information and these payment systems now have become so advanced. It, it takes out more friction to get to a conversion. Um, but I think the catalog is the number one thing that us brands need to start managing. It's why I got involved with uh, the company syndicate. They really intrigued me what Chris John is doing over there. Um, I actually personally came involved with him and, and started working with him because I was really, he sees a space where we can actually start to um, manage our business and our best asset, which is our brand. And so how we can intersect with the consumer where we're intersecting them, but our catalog is the way in control over our brand and how it's being perceived by the consumer is the most important thing we do. So any tool around that um, is critical. That's what made shoes.com. We pivoted with on our catalog, we moved the biggest strength of the company was it was the biggest catalog in the shoe industry at one point. And then the weakness became, it was, became an overwhelming website, right? Andy, like you just said, mm -hmm. did it get outdated? What happened? How did the business turn around? We started curating, right? We started actually creating shops and experiences and suggesting product. And so that was at an infancy and this with, with tools and artificial intelligence and data, you'll be able to, uh, to your point, I wasn't even thinking the size thing, although the size thing is quite a friction that you mentioned earlier. And I think that's great. Um, I just, you know, what happens if you're in some of these uh, programs and you're, you're shopping for a spouse or you're shopping for children or other family members or for gifts. So that's the only time with a sizing thing, but it's an interesting concept. You said like, just eliminate all the other noise and please, uh, I was, we were doing it in a more rudimentary way. How do you cur curate the line? So I don't, <laughs> I think that's super salient because I mean, obviously people can have a thousand SKUs. They can have 3000 SKUs that sit there. And then how is a person supposed to go on there and find something really interesting that matches their personality, their desire, et cetera. And I think, I think data, you know, big data will get us there. And I think, but it behooves the companies to start to understand that and start to think that way and curate. And, and I do think that's also why we have first insight on and volumental is because it is about reducing that friction from finding what you want and then making that payment. And there's a reason why Amazon does the swipe, right? That automatically just swipes it and it sends it. You don't even think about it. But I think that's really the key too, is capturing the consumer's data. And I, I think you, you, you make a really salient point of capturing beyond. So what we capture now, a lot of times on websites is, you know, what's Andy's information and what they should be asking for is add a family member right add your kids add your wife who else do you shop for that you might want to add their birthday we'll remind you of birthdays coming up we'll send you a coupon for a pair of shoes so expanding that out personalizing that a lot more um i think is super important but but as i was saying on the friction side you we have first insight and i you know i'll, I'll do the sales pitch for you but it, it really is about before you ever engage people on this journey, it's finding out what they want at the start, right, Charlie? It's finding out, you know, um, we're, the brand has got these SKUs, what really are people wanting, what style, what color, and then what price you're gonna have. And then, and for volumental, really, it is about that fit part, because if you can get a shoe scan and you can know their, their shoe type and their, you know, all the different uh, data points on how they walk and how they grade and all these other things, then you can start to look at the other brands and scan what they have and, and find a better fit that, that reduces that friction. And eventually you're, you're curating that catalog. You're reducing, you know, you, you can almost eliminate the shoe size. You know what it is through using something like volumental. And then with obviously Klarna is not on here, but then you have a payment system where I think it's amazing. You can buy a pair of shoes over four installments now. Um, and I think that's hugely important in our environment where you're going to see a lot of we're about to see a cliff of disposable income for consumers uh, after the stimulus checks run out, after the renter um, prevention program runs out where people can't get uh, evicted if they can't make their payments on their rent. That's running out at the end of July. And so I, I really think all those things are really important. Um, my, kind of my next focus really, I was gonna dive directly into brick and mortar, but I think- Well, what, actually I'm, just um, yeah, add tax to, to that for, for a second, I think, um, I think what we all need to realize is that uh, a, a consumer is very swiftly changed into a situation in which marketing is going to be a, it's going to be a drag. 
Actually, I think we're all so tired of just being bombarded with, with generic information. But what consumers of the future are going to look for is recommendations, essentially. They want to interact uh, with things that make sense for them in their specific context. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that brings you uh, exactly back to, uh, to data and what kind of data can you get on somebody when you interact with them online, but also how can you leverage the fact that actually somebody spends the effort to go into your store, spend time there uh, and interacts with you there. What can you learn in that environment that actually allows you to provide more valuable insights to a consumer in online channels afterwards? And I think that mindset to move away from what can we do in marketing to push generic messages towards how can we actually learn what's interesting, what's relevant, and then give recommendations that somebody actually is happy about, that somebody gets excited about and doesn't see as uh, something that's pushed uh, into their face. And I think that's at Volumento, one thing that, uh, that we have seen in our data is that um, if you actually, if you 3D scan somebody, people love to interact with, with that kind of data. Um, we send those scans by email um, uh, to consumers after they, they leave a the store. And uh, a lot of people are, are pulling up that data just to understand, okay, how do I differ from, from the rest of the population and how can I use this data to actually make better buying decisions? And then what we're also seeing is once you integrate that data into recommendations through, uh, for example, targeted email campaigns or through giving recommendations on social that are based and time back to that 3D foot data, people are ecstatic about that. People like the click through rates that we're seeing on that, it's, it's off the charts. Um, and I think that just really speaks to uh, what consumers are expecting going forward. We're, we're moving away from this one size fits all and it's really about how can you figure out what provides value for one individual? If you just to go back on the, if you think about the effectiveness of a, a website and selling product on, on e-commerce for a brand or a retailer is, you know, you'd love to set up your website that it caters to the product that your customer already shows value in and be able to test that up front so that when they jump right into shopping for a specific type of footwear that what, what comes to the top of the things that's already been tested, the customer says, you know, these are relevant to me, I find value in these. And also think about the message you're putting across, what's important to the customer and the message. If you're talking about the comfort in the shoe, what's about, what are the, the parts of that comfort in the shoe that you can test to tell them about what's most important to them, what's gonna resonate with them, that's gonna drive conversion. You know, testing that up front, I think is really important as well. And you think about what, what else do you buy with that shoe? Or what, you know, even what you think about buying apparel, what do you suggest with that apparel? So you could test with the customers what types of things they like to match together and do that sort of recommendation. So really making a, a customer a website to be much more effective in driving conversion. And, and I think too, you know, and I guess I'm kind of narrowing this thing to a website, but I, I'm pretty sure we're going to see sales on Instagram and Facebook and all that explode in the coming years where you just buy it on social directly. Yep. Um, and websites may be the hub where you have a curated collection where they can go look at everything. Um, but if you have a personalization and the data behind it, then you can just start selling off these channels directly. And you, and they may never visit your website ever again. They may never, they may never go to your URL and may just, you know, find a different way. Um, let's jump into brick and mortar really quickly. Cause I think this is obviously we had, there, there's this whole narrative about the decline of brick and mortars and COVID has only added to that. But I, I do think that, especially for footwear, there's still a need for me to take my my girls in here or two and four to the store at some point when, when we get through this to try on shoes as they keep growing. Um, and so families continually will need to go into stores. You can't, I, I don't think we'll ever see a true death of a store. I mean, also we just got to get out of our houses every now and again to go to Dairy Queen and get an ice cream and go down the, the strip mall, right? So, um, but when we think about what brick and mortar is going to be, I think I'll tee it up really quickly and I'll just open it up to the group, but I see brick and mortar becoming, obviously there'll be, there'll be less of a footprint. I think it'll, there'll be more stock in the back where, where they could actually um, use. And we've seen this with shoe carnival where they use their stores as kind of mini warehouses. I think there'll be more of that. I see folks like Amazon opening up, um, they'll find retail spaces and setting up more of their locker program where they're, in, they'll encourage people if you're out driving to go pick something up, you can stop by this local Amazon locker store to pick up your good and we'll take a dollar off of the, the cost. So I think we'll be, I think we'll see more like depots 
where people can pick up stuff in stores, almost like a laundromat where you walk in, you, someone's there behind the counter, you don't see any product, but they're going to give you a ticket and they'll go to the back and pick it up. Something like that. I think, um, I think in stores, I, you know, there's a couple of questions that came in, but, and I, and I think more, it's kind of hit on it, but it's like, when they come into the store, what are we capturing? Are, we, are they just walking around and we don't know what they're looking at and why they picked up that box versus another box? And obviously we have RFID and tags and heat maps and things like that. Well, these things in stores become ever more useful when we start using more augmented reality to test shoes on our feet uh, in stores. You know what? There's a lot to it, I guess, when we look at brick and mortar, but when you guys are talking to your partners and, and Bob, when you're, when you're looking at what your, your, uh, your customers, when you're, when you're looking at even, you know, big box or whatever, how are, how are folks looking at kind of the future and thinking, you know, we gotta, we gotta make some changes here, obviously, because we need the social distance, but beyond this, you know, what's the, what's the experience? Cause I feel like it's bleeding from this conversation we had about digital and these touch points and the digital is just, it's almost like there's no such thing as online versus offline. It's all one space holistically now where they're in the store, they're doing different things. So I'll just open it up and, and let you guys share what you're thinking about brick and mortar, the, the footprint of it, the look of it, the engagement of it. Um, Charlie, why don't you start? Because I know you, you work with Coles for a while and then we'll pop to Bob. Yeah. The more it's yeah. You know, I, obviously we all know that uh, brick and mortar has been in a decline for quite some time now. So yeah, the model that existed whether it's three, four, five, ten years ago, just isn't a model that's going to um, allow brick and mortar to, to exist going forward. So now I'm hearing a lot about like changing the whole experience and that turning brick and mortar into a more of a multi-purpose solution, um, bringing technology into brick and mortar, and and also bringing sort of entertainment into brick and mortar. Um, I think of you know from a multi-purpose that you talked about the whole idea of supporting e-commerce fulfillment. You think about, you know, Bopus, ship from store, and now with the advent of curbside has, you know, accelerated so much with COVID, is that you really want to be the, have those stores positioned with the right inventory to fulfill e-commerce in a way that is probably when you're shipping from a local store is fast. You can get same day, next day, and probably more cost effective than shipping out of an e-commerce fulfillment center. So that, that's an alternative way to help to help do that. Um, but I also think about, you know, like providing new and innovative services within that, that model. I think of Cole's example with Amazon returns was uh, quite a bit of success to drive more traffic to stores. And in essence, the only way to get stores to be more productive and profitable is to drive more traffic. Um, but even, you know, entertainment, whether it's like virtual merchandising in store or it's uh, interactive uh, digital dressing rooms, things like that, just to kind of give people a reason to come other than just walking through the aisles as they had in the past. Mm -hmm. Bob, what are, you, what are you thinking about or hearing about or? Yeah, I listen, I think a lot of the purchasing decision happened before she ever went to the parking lot. And I think, and I'm with you, I, I think people are looking for um, reasons to go out of the house today and they always will, right? They, you know, we're social beings, Andy, so I think that that, that is there. But I do think that the format, and you're right, I think people, I'm really happy to hear about that for Shoe Carnival or whoever is turning there. I always found it intriguing that some of these very large chains already have warehouses everywhere. Uh, and I know that's much easier said than done, right? There's a lot of infrastructure and a change and, and to pivot to that. But I, I'm glad to hear that because it's how I see it. I, I think the good people are trying to do that. Um, and I think there, some people are successful and motivate them. You know, some people will use them as giving them a bounce back to come pick it up and not pay FedEx or UPS or the postal service. Uh, that's why I mentioned the milkman. I'm not trying to, the milkman went away, right? Uh, it wasn't efficient, even though they started selling you more things. And besides milk at one time, it went away because it came more efficient. So if that wins out, that's going to be the big game is which model is the most efficient over the long haul if it becomes commoditized, right? And it's not a branded experience. That'll just be the game. Uh, or if they value that. Right now, it's high value because some people don't want to leave and they're concerned. And that's why I mentioned the online uh, food delivery service that, you know, it's amazing to me that the kids will 
the next generation will think nothing of paid fifteen dollars worth of Chipotle and they just paid somebody probably ten plus dollars to show up in a car and drop off fifteen dollars worth of Chipotle. Right. I'm scratching my head and I'm arguing if we can charge five ninety five to deliver a pair of shoes from California to Massachusetts. Right. Um, you know, so you you know it's about the customer's value proposition, and I do think that the stores will be reimagined. I don't think that, and I, to your point, if maybe the front room is smaller. Maybe the, the layout is different, right? It, it may not be Paco Underhill back in the day and the milk is in the back of the store. So I need to go through, you know, two blocks worth of merchandise to get to the milk to get out of there because, you know, the customers, you know, knows that game a little bit, you know, things have evolved. And I do think that's the case. I think they're, to your point, what's the heat maps in stores? What is successful? I think some of those things just need to be re-examined. Um, and I think some of those, some of the, that viewing of customer behavior led to the good formats that you saw work for periods of times in our history. And it's probably gonna have to, we're gonna have to brush that same thinking off again. But I do wanna say a lot of the consideration already had started. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, I, I think everybody on this call is saying to think that you the first point of consideration i'm not saying that doesn't happen but a good amount of the shoppers that go into stores uh the journey has already begun and i think that's the major change that i would say to my team to the brands that if you think that they just showed up for the first time and they were perusing these wonderful stores that do you know do nice jobs merchandising but it, it it's not uh, that's that's the thing that's changing rapidly, um, and so when when does the consideration, when does awareness turn into consideration? Uh, and I think the consideration part is the thing that I think that people need to uh, get a grab, grasp on. Uh, and if they're not, then you got to get to the awareness, and that's a whole other marketing. Um, you see the people who are caught, who who are creating great brands today, and right. they've done it, and they've still done it. There are winners out there, right? I mean, you know, we know who they are. They've done a nice job. Uh, and I think those are the things that we, we just have to sit back a little bit. Um, and again, there are challenges. This isn't easy. This COVID thing, I'm telling you, being an operator, running a business, you know, everything on the balance sheet and income statements has to be reconsidered. <laughs> um, so much easier said than done. But if we're forward thinking, um, the digital journey started long before COVID has only accelerated it. Okay. Moritz, what are, what are you, what are you hearing? What are you guys you know, what is the data telling you about in-store right now is, is some, some stores have been open for a couple of months. Unfortunately, some stores are reclosing in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, what, what, do you, what do you envision happening as we go forward? What are stores going to look like and how are people going to engage with product in store? Yeah. Just if we look in the here and now, what we've seen over the last uh, couple of weeks and months now is that um, uh, in the U.S., as you guys all know, uh, we've seen... Um, a super strong recovery actually up until like two two three weeks ago um in our data and uh, now as we're getting more cases it's actually starting to uh, to drop down again if we're talking about uh, what retail of the future looks like i think um i think again the important thing here is to think about this as uh, as a holistic consumer journey Mm -hmm. Retail is one of your touch points that you have with the consumer. And as a, as a brand, as a retailer, your question is, what can I provide in physical retail that I can't really provide in the online channels? And I think the, the main topics that, that surface in that is um, experience and then social. Right? Uh, we see, for example, our customer, Glee, they are... Uh, they're using their stores as hubs where, where they gather people to, uh, to then start their runs together, where they have educational activities, where they add additional value in that consumer journey uh, that ties people to, uh, to the ecosystem, that creates that awareness and that makes them top of mind when somebody comes back to the purchase decision later. So I think it's really about uh, yeah, create, create something that is attractive, that justifies that somebody leaves their couch um, and actually spends the, the time to, uh, to come to your store. Yeah, and I'll, you know, I was in a, before before all this, I was at a Home Depot and I remember I was grabbing paint or something and uh, I was chatting with a very chatty kind of store clerk and uh, he said, you know, I, I had my little daughter with me and he was like, you know, we do this Saturday event where we train 
these kids how to make a birdhouse every Saturday, or we do this different thing. And I was like, oh, really, do you have a lot of people who, uh, who join? And he, he was like, actually, we have 300 families that come in every Saturday and take up half the store and we have to like rope it off. And I was amazed. And I just thought like, as, as technical as our industry is about designing shoes and developing shoes and playing with materials and, and how consumers love to engage with that, why don't we have in stores these training shops to let people play with things and test things or a 3D printer? Um, and I, you know, and, or, or even non footwear things like how to make a cup of coffee, you know, as a, a brew, like a barista comes in from Starbucks and does that. So I think there's, there's interesting things and ways that we can do it. And, you know, I think we just got to start testing some things. Um, and the other thing before we get, I want to get to some consumer, consumer trends that we see. And I know Charlie has some insights um, on some of the stuff coming up back to school shopping and leading into holiday sales. But, uh, but, uh, but I also think, you know, just as we talked about being holistic around digital and in store, I think we also need to consider that the store itself, we, we're limiting the store to, and we have before COVID, we limited it to the front doors and COVID has busted out into the parking lot where now you're having to deliver product into people's, you know, uh, into their cars where they're parked and you go out and you deliver it. And I've been a long proponent. People think I'm crazy, but I do think that at some point someone's going to create a delivery service where you can get a pair of shoes within an hour from a retailer, either through Postmates or Uber or something like that. And, it, and if retailers aren't thinking about that, and I mean, obviously if Bob said that they're paying five bucks for a delivery of a milkshake from five guys, which is delicious by the way, um, <laughs> then I think we're, we're losing our minds that why wouldn't the consumer want that if you offered it to them? If you put it on the website and said it's 10 bucks, and you had an associate do it or you hired somebody, what do you care if they do it or not, right? I mean, at least there's an option that you're providing a value that they're like, wow, maybe I will do that. Um, so th these things are, I mean, obviously we'll, we'll continue to have these conversations and things will keep pivoting. And, and But I think part of this conversation is to pull people out of, uh, it's to pull their head off the grindstone from where we're at and pull it a little bit forward and look up and see some of this stuff happening. Um, and I do want to jump in really quickly to consumer behaviors and consumer insights as we, we jump in and then we'll get to the questions. We go a little bit over an hour. I'm not concerned about it in the least. As I said before, COVID casual, where is where are anybody going anyway? Um, so um, as we as we kind of look at as we kind of look at uh, consumer kind of choices and product, I'm really interested to see what you guys are thinking in terms of or hearing in terms of what kind of product. I mean. I think during COVID, we've heard a lot about casual. We've heard a lot about athleisure, you know, sneakers, slippers, obviously, uh, for, for Bob and Deerfoam, the best slippers in the marketplace, right? Um, but when we're seeing that, you know, what are people willing to spend money on if they're really afraid about jobs, if they're afraid about, you know, things going forward? Are we going to see consumer behavior change from, I'm going into a store, I'm going online and I'm buying three or four pairs and now I'm gonna buy one pair. You know, what are you guys seeing around demand, product? Um, and then, you know, we talked about personalization, et cetera, but really kind of, where do you think, I mean, we, we did the poll and the polls showed that there, people are estimating that there's gonna be a large drop off in the percent of sales this year versus last year, obviously. So, but, but the poll numbers, showed you know upwards of 30 percent down from the year before which is very frightening but also it's probably very likely that we will see that in our industry um so how do, how do we look at you know demand right now from consumers what do they want to buy um are they going to buy a lot this year are we going to see a pullback etc um bob i guess we'll start with you put you on the hot seat again and then and then we'll go to moritz and then charlie yeah listen i i think Listen, it's really tough. I mean, that's the disruption that COVID has created. Some of the categories aren't as relevant. Uh, and that's the, you know, I think every company, myself included, has to look at, is this, does this recover or does this go away? Because the consumer has adopted just more rapidly. Um, and is it coming back, right? The travel industry, uh, travel bags, is that happening? There was, you know, travel was outstanding. So I think that has to, that's something we're dealing with. Certainly anything around the home uh, had been, you know, that's not new. Something around wellness, something around casual, relaxed casual, athleisure. I mean, all those endeavors were pretty hot categories, you know, but we're hearing more about loungewear than ever before. So any product and footwear that goes with those wearing occasions, I think will be 
uh, washable will continue uh, to be strong. And I think some of those things are, are just accelerated. Um, yeah, do, am I running to buy dress shoes right now? Probably, you know, not the, on the immediate purchase. You know, as we go into back to school, you know, I'm in the bag business. You know, what, what does that do? Are the kids really going back to school? Are they going back time? Uh, how are backpacks going to do, um, you know, at the home? So I definitely see anything that is in the current categories doing well. Um, I do think that the consumer behavior pre-COVID has accelerated dramatically on those trends. I mean, athleisure was, you know, I was selling before Andy, right? It was not, right. <laughs> it's not a new trend. Right. Uh, it's just, you have more of us doing it now uh, than ever before. And I think there'll be an evolution. I don't think people are going to sit there and just have, you know, you know, Netflix binge watch all day long and be at their couches and, you know, have, you know, hoodie sweatshirts on completely. But I, you know, I, I think it'll evolve um, quite a bit. Um, and, and I see major, you know, listen, major changes. There's a lot of relaxed, casual sandals being sold now, right? The weather has cooperated and I think weather patterns will have uh, an impact on that. I think the outdoor interest will continue. Yeah. Uh, outdoor, I think is, um, you know, don't, don't sleep on the outdoor right now. I, I know it's often, not often talked about, but you know, what are you going to be doing? I think there's going to be a lot more outdoor endeavors uh, than there has been in a long time. Um, so that's what I'm seeing. Great points. Maurice, what, what are you thinking about uh, back to school around the holidays, around products, around consumer demand? What are you guys seeing in the data and what are you hearing? I think just to, uh, to keep it short, I, I think my prediction would be that um, we'll see we'll see consumers focusing more on value. Right? Essentially with the money that they're spending, making sure that they're making great decisions. So it's less about buying lots of different styles, but about finding the right thing. And then people are willing to spend on that. I think mean, that's a great point. Cause I think we need, we do need to think a little bit more about the durability of our shoes. People are gonna want to buy something more stable, that's longer lasting this bash fashion that we've had where you buy a pair of shoes that last four months um, may not be in vogue quite as much and they might be willing to spend. And I, I think that's a real thing to watch is to what you just said was it's the value proposition that we're giving them. Um, and what do they want with it? Do they want the, do they really want the fast fashion and they want to spend 10 bucks and buy another pair in two or three months of the same type or something similar? Do they want to spend $30 for a pair of shoes that's going to last them six or eight months? Um, so, so that's really interesting. And, and I know Charlie, First Insight does a lot of research and analysis for brands um, with consumers. And I, I'm excited to, to, to have you kind of present a little bit about what you guys are seeing and hearing in the marketplace right now as well. Yeah, you know, as, as Bob said, this thing is completely disrupted the customer and then they're, they're moving faster than ever then throw COVID on top of it. And um, customer preferences, behaviors, purchasing power, it's all changing and it's, it's changing so fast just based on, you know, with spikes in COVID, it, it, it's changing. So um, we're doing a lot of surveying, uh, not only across the industry, but a lot of our customers to find out, okay, so how is the customer changing? Uh, we have customers asking questions about, you know, what's important from them now from a product perspective. And Bob was talking about the whole the whole loungewear, sleepwear thing. And yeah, we find that the customers, they value that a lot more than they did going into the COVID. And they're, they're valuing other things um, less, you know, we're trying to understand what they value in a, a, a shopping experience, you know, both online and in store and, you know, contactless masks important to them and what fulfillment opportunities are important to them. So really, you know, utilizing those surveys to, you know, quickly get a pulse in the customer, you know, the way we test, we turn things around so fast you know, 24 to 48 hours that you can redo tests over whether you want to do it on a monthly or quarterly basis to see if that customer's value or the customer's opinions and what's important to them is changing. I did want to share my screen real quickly to show yeah, you. Uh, as COVID kicked off, we started a longitudinal study that we've been um, putting out there every couple of weeks to find out how the customer is changing especially focused on, on purchasing. And, and we were able to actually get some detailed information on, on the footwear industry specifically, but um, I just want to share this with you real quick. And, uh, there we go. Um, so here, just uh, the current slide. 
so basically what you know what we've learned in in, in this longitudinal survey that we've done is that uh, you know almost half the customers are requiring a, you know at least a 30 percent discount just to come back into the stores and you know almost a third of them are requiring a 40 percent or more discount so they were really to your point, what Maureen said, they're, they're really looking for value and immediate value. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of that. You know, when it comes to footwear, we looked at that specifically, and uh, it's even more drastic. I mean, only 35% of the people are really looking for a 30 to 30% off discount to come back to the stores. We're over two thirds were telling us that they need more than a 30% discount. And in some cases, you got to see that that 12%, they're not even willing to come back yet. <laughs> You know, that's afraid of, we might be a lost customer from that, from that perspective. And we also kind of broke it out by gender. So this is kind of data that we can get to very fast um, for our customers. So they not only understand high level what their customers are thinking, but, you know, can better segment is it, you know, male versus female, is it a generational thing? And, you know, interestingly enough, uh, males are more willing to, I think, come back quicker and pay closer to regular price. Um, and similarly with the younger generation, you know, they're, they're less price sensitive, as you can see the Gen Z and the millennials, and are, are more likely to start buying as you compare to Gen X and then, and then boomers. So uh, really interesting information. This is something we're going to continue to repeat through this, because I think it's going to continue to change and, and morph. And I think it's really important that uh, people stay close to their customers, find out what they need, what's important. Um, so whether it's designing the right product or how to get it to them, or how to display it to them, and you can you know, do it with the, the voice of the customer uh, data. I, I do have a question for you, especially around some of the stuff when we're looking at, we're looking at gender generation. Is there is there a push where, when we were talking about personalization of what does the consumer want, to a certain extent, you would think the brand would say, how do we change, and this sounds you know nefarious, but how do we change prices based on location, based on, maybe because of the shipping cost or whatever, but, but also based on how old this person is, what they may be willing to take. Like, cause I know, you know, when I walk into a coal store, you can walk around and all of a sudden the prices may drop because inventory didn't move for a while. So obviously you, you can change it in real time and online, my assumption would be just like we see discounts, you know, again, I'm not trying to be nefarious, but are, are people considering like how they personalize around price points? Cause you know, Jim may be a real, yeah, he may be very miserly and the only way you're going to get him to, to buy that shoe he's looking at is to sell it at a 40% off and you know that and then you offer it to him that way. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what you think or. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely, it's, you're trying to you cater your pricing, your product to that specific customer. And, you know, a store like Kohl's caters to customers from zero to a hundred, you know, age zero to a hundred. So, you know, what's that junior customer willing to pay? And, you know, are they somebody that's willing to, they're looking really more about, you know, fashion and not really necessarily to pay more where maybe a, a boomer customer might be more interested in, um, you know, in, in durability and comfort and willing to pay more. So you can definitely uh, establish pricing based on those types of um, feedback from your customers. Yeah, great. Um, and thanks for that. And there, there's questions coming in and chats coming in and I want to get to those really quickly. Uh, we'll spend just a few minutes, but uh, there was one on... I can pull this up correctly. Uh, there was one on um, Bob. You, you mentioned a company that you guys have been working with. It was Syndicate. Is that correct? Syndicate. Yeah, I'm on the board of advisors with Chris John. Um, he, a gentleman. He had approached. You know, we had spoken. A real smart guy. He had seen some of the issues with brands and created some white space of how to how to get you know one of our number one assets as brands our catalog live. Um, I call it Styles Live, but then also how to manage your catalog. So he's, some people just look at it as, a, you know, getting a, the products up, uh, that's one part of it, but uh, managing the experience with your brand and, and where your product does show up and what products get showed up. And you, you spoke about segmentation earlier, certain places have the products, certain don't. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, having some tools that allow, some of it's around pricing, um, you know, those are the neck, those are the tools that we, I think as an industry, we're behind um, on how to manage our brands online. So that's the only reason why I mentioned uh, syndicate. Um, so I'm on, you know, and I'll just make sure you know, Andy, I don't think you know this. I'm on the board of advisors with Chris on that. Uh, he really intrigued me with what he's doing. It's some innovative work and it's a white space. Um, 
So, and I saw the value when I was at Shoe Buy, um, you know, because I saw a lot of feeds coming across the wire uh, and, and brands being able to manage that. I could see it from both sides when I was here at RGB to Rockport then being over on the retail side. So it's, I'd say it is an industry where we need to move forward in that area. Um, I don't disagree with the consumer insights that are on this call. Charlie is 100% correct, uh, without question. And more, it's, uh, you know, creating engagement, points of contact with the consumer. But, you know, at the end of the day, we, you know, one of the things is we need to manage our catalogs as brands uh, pretty, pretty dramatically. So it is something that I am uh, involved with. Um, Great. Uh, and I did see yeah. a comment from Gretchen from Person Site saying that, the next survey would actually be about how consumers feel about pricing by a different channel for online versus mm -hmm. in store. There is, I mean, I think we've seen some of that in the past. I don't know what it is now, but we saw in the past, actually, the consumer assumes that online, online prices are cheaper than in store. And oftentimes they may be a little bit more. They may be online retailers may be padding in the numbers a little bit because they may offer free shipping, but you're paying a little bit more on the price, something like that. But well, that's definitely an interest of, of, what people are willing to pay online in store, what kind of delivery costs, you know, as we go forward through this, I think that a future real challenge on e-commerce is going to be capacity to deliver. So this two day or one day shipping, do we have enough, do we have enough vehicles to deliver it in one day or two day? And then how do you prioritize that? And obviously in economics, price determines what gets moved. Um, so shipping costs, you may be free on the, maybe free on the checkout, but it may be built into the cost in some ways. So I think it's uh, it's an interesting point to consider that too and all these things. Um, there was a comment about digital twins and and um, 3D visualization issues uh, around augmented reality. And, um, and I, I think part of that is just the operational points that Bob and others were talking about earlier is if you want to be profitable, it's not, it's not just about what channel it is, it's about streamlining your design development production supply chains to become profitable. And, and part of it is having the right product mix and, and how you manage that. And part of it is making sure that your models uh, in your backroom operations are, are succinct. And I think that has been our biggest challenge as an industry is this digital transformation issue. Um, people don't understand the software, don't understand the workflows are very different than the traditional models. We, we actually have an online series going right now. Um, if you go to um, I think it's footweardigitaltransformation.com. We're running a 3D series on how to set up uh, 3D design programs, development, production, uh, first insight and volume in are both sponsors of that. And we're we'll talking about big data issues, how you can use 3D models to show consumers where they can spin it around and you can get insights on how they feel about it. So you can, you can actually market a shoe in 3D before you ever sell it to see if it will sell and what price point you might want. So there, there's a lot of these digital things that we're still considering, thinking about starting to integrate and go through. Um, and, and I think that will help a lot on the strategy side. Um, uh, some of the other questions were just comments uh, from folks, which is great. We love comments um, uh, and sharing those, those insights. But at this point, it's about 310. Uh, I really want to thank all our panelists because it's been a really good conversation. This is exactly what I wanted. I wanted us to have, I want us to talk about what's happening and have a free flow and a conversation about these things. Cause I do think conversations over a cup of coffee or anything like that are the, the best way for us to think about what's happening. Um, you know, and, and think things out and, and discuss things with each other. Um, I don't know if there's any closing points any of you would like to make, but feel free before I wrap it up and, we knock off Charlie. Do you, is there anything we missed or anything that you want to share before we, before we hop off? No, I'm good. I just want to thank you for the opportunity and a pleasure to be a part of this. And I think it was a great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Moritz, is there anything that you can find ways to get through this, right? <laughs> exactly. Moritz, is there anything that, that, that we missed or anything you want to share that, uh, that, that we didn't cover? Good connecting with you guys. Um, if somebody wants to continue the conversation, add me on LinkedIn. Um, write to me, Moritz, at volumental.com. We're always happy to, uh, to engage and to, uh, to talk about what is your digital journey and how can we help with, uh, with these big data questions. Great. Bob, last, uh, any, anything we missed? Anything you want to talk about? I know you were 
you had a lot on your your list of things to cover. Hopefully, we covered it all, and I want to steal all your wisdom and knowledge uh, on this webinar. So, anything that we missed? Thank you. No, listen. Uh, there's a lot of things out there to attack, Andy. I would tell people that I do think big data. I do think creating um, new toolboxes, uh, new tools in the toolbox are important. But you know, one thing I would tell you is algorithms look backwards uh, and they're powerful. Uh, people and strategy look forward. Uh, and I think to take this forward, it's the epitome of art meets science. Uh, and it's a fun, looking at it uh, as a fun, uh, transformative time for the industry as opposed to, you know, you can get caught up pretty negatively. And I, my, I empathize with everybody because in a COVID environment, this isn't fun. Uh, but I, I think staying motivated to the future of some of the optimistic things out there, you know, listening to Moritz and Charlie were, you know, were motivating to me and, and inviting me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, great. Thank you, Bob, for taking the time. And thank you to Charlie and Moritz as well. I think Moritz, what is it, nine o'clock over there? It is, yeah. Thank you for joining at nine o'clock at night. We're like interviewing his. Uh, we're we're interrupting his Netflix hour. Uh, Sunny there, huh? Join us. <laughs> um, we did have in the in the chat box before we drop off. Uh, I did see Charlie and Moritz drop in their email addresses. Folks can also email me if you want to get in contact. But I would encourage you guys to one hundred percent work with First Insight and work with Volume L around understanding inventory and pricing to make sure that you're selling the right shoes to the, at the right price to the consumers and also with volume mental around how they can help you with data analysis, tracking, better understanding consumers and really about getting that right fit um, where they can scan the consumer's foot and attach it to your inventory um, and make sure that that, make sure that you reduce your returns, make sure that the, the right fit is the right fit the first time, I guess, um, to say. Um, and of course, you know, uh, folks definitely as you're, watching your Netflix go out and buy some uh, some RG Berry best in class deer foam slippers um, to enjoy it fully in comfort. So um, so with that, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. This 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 recording will be posted uh, in the next 24 hours on our kicksovercoffee.com channel where we interview a range of different people um, about different topics. So definitely go to that channel if you want to review this or you want to send it to colleagues, that will be posted there. Um, and you can find a range of other information. Um, if anyone out there is furloughed or is unemployed in the footwear industry, please contact us at FDRA.org. We can provide some help and resources in terms of information. We can connect you with Tutin Footwear Foundation, which is helping people in need right now. Um, but just in general, please you know, visit FDRA.org often to find a range of industry-wide uh, resources across all departments to help you do your job better. Um, and with that, again, I want to thank you guys and thank our panelists and I hope everybody stays safe and healthy and has a great afternoon and evening in Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you.